Welcome to The Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastor Jim Cobray. I'm going to get down on my knees and pray. I need God, but so do you. So let's go before the Lord. Come on, stand to your feet. And let's go before the Lord and let's pray together. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. And we remind ourselves as well as you, Lord, that we have not come to in the house of God to hear from a man or woman. We haven't come to hear from a tall man or short man. We haven't come to hear from a black man or white man or brown man. We haven't come to hear from an old man or young man. But God, we have come to hear from the teacher of the church who is the Holy Spirit. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us, and encourage us, guide us, guard us, direct us, and motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, glory, and all the honor. How good it is to be in this place tonight. May your words become alive on the inside of us, engrafted into our hearts, and we'll give you the praise. Now, Lord, we need to pray also not only for ourselves, but for other churches that are out there preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ in the Inland Empire as well as around the entire planet. We bless our Baptist brothers and Lutherans and Methodists, Episcopalian, Charismatics, Pentecostals. We thank you for Calvary chapels and Harvest and Valley and Oasis and Inland Christian Center. We thank you for the Assemblies of God, the Four Square, the Well, the Way. The, we thank you, Lord, for Ecclesia Church and Trinity Emmanuel, all the great churches that are out there, Lord. We ask you to bless them as you would bless us. And God will give you the praise, give you the glory, give you the honor. In Jesus' mighty name, with a great big shout, we all say amen. amen. Well, go ahead and get your Bible. Go with me to 1 Timothy, if you will, in the sixth chapter. This is part number five of the journey into a prosperous life. A lot of times we don't, and I've repeated this five times, but for those of you that didn't hear it first four times, I'll just say it for you one more time. And this is a shock. When I first heard this and read about my Bible and saw it, it shocked me. I couldn't believe that God wanted to prosper me. I couldn't believe that God cared about enough of me that he wanted to prosper me. All through the scripture, whether it's Old Testament, whether it's New Testament, God wants to prosper his people. And what we found out and what we've been talking about is prosperity is not just money in your pocket. That's not prosperity. That's probably the lowest realm of real prosperity. Prosperity is the fullness of life, which, by the way, includes money in your pocket. If I can make this statement, and I'll put it up on the overhead for you, being godly will not get you economic gain, but it will make you prosperous. Being godly is expected. Being godly is we as Christians, this is our Reasonable service, Romans the 12th chapter says. And being godly will get you prosperous. And prosperous means your home is blessed, your family's blessed, your children's blessed, your marriage is blessed, your grandchildren someday are blessed, and your education is blessed, your job's blessed, the hand of God is on you every day. You're I love this one. Your health is blessed. And when you finally get to the place where you realize this is not just about money. This is about a lifestyle that God wants to take you into your own personal promised land. And as you do, it's an amazing thing. So being godly, which is really our reasonable service, will not Listen to this, get you economic gain, won't hurt you either in that area, but guess what? But it will make you prosperous. In other words, fulfilling every one of your heart's desire at the end of your life. And that's a rich man, by the way. Amen. And so important for us to see that because we come along, and can I just say this? If you talking about gaining economically, then could I take you back to Galatians 
what you sow, you... Let me try it again. What you sow, you... In other words, if you sow nothing, you get... If you sow something, you... Everything produces Galatians' first chapter after its own kind. So it's impossible for the seed, if you will, of an apple seed to produce a tomato. And it's impossible for a tomato seed to produce a cucumber or a pear. Because everything produces after its own kind. And so when you're in this area and you're depositing and you're putting in something and you're sowing in it with God, that'll bring you economic gain. It's as simple as that. But if you don't put in what you need to put in, you expect it just to fall from the sky. Let me tell you something, it doesn't work that way. And we've been talking about that for four examples. I'm not going to rehearse, I'm not going to review, uh, but I would love to encourage you. If you did not get a hold of part one, two, three, and four, I, I personally think they were phenomenal. And you need to get them. And, you know, if you don't have the money to get them, talk to them back there. Say, Pastor Chip said I can have them free. But you can have them free if you really don't have the money. If you have the money and you go back there and say, uh, let me have them free because Pastor Jim said I can free, but I have the money. Guess what? Then liars don't enter into heaven and you don't want to mess up your entire life over a set of CDs. Go for much, something much bigger. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? And uh, rob the bank or something, you know? Uh, but uh, so, no, I'm only kidding, all right? I'm only kidding. Some of you take me so serious, like you write it down and go tell everybody, pastor told me to go rob a bank. And uh, I'm playing with you right now. You need to stick around and find out what kind of a personality I have. I'm not quite sure myself. Sixth chapter of 1 Timothy, verse, if you will, 9 and 10 says this. But those who desire, let's put it up. Those who desire, the word desire there has a great passion. In other words, the desire is above everything else. And he makes this statement, those who desire to be rich fall into temptations and they snare. Now, he's, can I just ask you, are you afraid to answer me the question? Would you like to be do you have some kind of desire to have extra income? Okay, so is he talking about we should be broke, down, busted, disgusted? What's he talking about? He's talking about a desire that supersedes the desire of God. Anytime that you have a passion for something above the passions of God, then that becomes idolatry. And he says, but those who desire or have passion above God to be rich fall into temptation and they stare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts in which uh, uh, well, drown men into destruction and perdition. And then he comes along verse number, if you will, in verse number, take a look at it with me, in verse number 10. And he, and he makes this statement. For the love of money, not the love of God, didn't say money, you can't have money. He, but he's saying the love of money, where the love that you have for money is greater than your love for God. Someone said, oh, that would never happen. It never happens until you have the money, and the money becomes your identity. Yeah. Some of the richest people, I've, I've just been around some of the richest people in recently, and I, I have to watch myself because I might be watching on, on this. Turn off if this is you that I'm talking about because I don't want you to hear. And some of the richest people I know, their identity is in their wealth. And they are the stingiest givers. <laughs> sorry. If you're watching, I'm sorry, it's true. They are the stingiest givers. And why don't they give? Because their identity, their recognition and approval of men their acceptance, everything is wrapped up. Their complete identity is on what they have. If they give away what they have, they lost their identity. So they don't give anything at all. You know, you go there and you sit down with them and you talk to them and it's a great thing. Oh, that's wonderful. They've got a half a billion dollars in the bank. They write you a check for 500 bucks. It's like, what is that? Keep it, man. I don't need your 500 bucks. That's all I'm talking about. See, because, listen to this, the love of money. 
In other words, where money itself, the economic condition of yourself is your approval, recognition, is your, becomes your identity, and you literally love money. When that happens, you're in an amazing position of failure, which is called idolatry. And it says this, it's the root of all kinds of evil. In other words, it's the very thing that keeps us from being what God would have us to be because we're now going to, because of the money, because of the identity, because of the recognition you get from that money, then what happens is that it becomes that this is what you do. You function contrary to the ways of God. That's what he just said. Of which some have snared from the, uh, excuse me, strayed from the faith because they had their finances realizing that the finances were more important to them than their relationship with God. So they keep a lukewarm relationship with God and a powerfully fired up relationship with the finances. And they spend more time on the finances than they do with God. And he says that kind of love gets you in trouble. Now notice what it says. In their greediness and they pierce themselves through. Notice how it says pierce themselves through. They made the choice. They made the call. God's not saying don't have money. He's saying how the money handles you. If the money handles you instead of you handling it, then all of a sudden you're in the wrong place. And he comes along and he says they pierce themselves through with many sorrows. I mean, that is such an eye-opener for all of us. God's not saying he doesn't want to prosper you in the area of economic gain. Economic gain is very important to all of us. But economic gain cannot be ahead of the things of God. The Bible makes it very clear. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek what? First his kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then it says, and then these things will be added on to you. And when they're added on to you, if they start to take the place of God, you end up failing according to what that just said. Are you following me? And that's the frailty. So God wants to take you to a place of economic gain. He wants to bless you. He wants to prosper you. But the question is whether or not we become mature enough that the prosperity doesn't control us and then God always controls us. And that's, the, that's absolutely the formula. That's the failure in all of this. And so what we've been doing the last five times we've been together as we've been looking at the Word of God, and there's so much about it. It's just amazing how much is in the Scripture about finances. Because why? Our hearts are easily tied to our finances. And what a person does with their finances has a lot to do with where their heart really is. And that God knows that. And that's why he talks about it so many times in scripture. In fact, he talks more about finances in scripture than he does about salvation. That's an amazing truth, isn't it? Shocking truth. So this is something I'm saying to you. God wants to prosper you, but there are conditions in the prosperity process. Are you following me? Tonight, things to do. I like these things to do. Number one, things to do. Write this down. Avoid the influence of the wicked. I don't know how many people see other people prosper that are not Christians and think so much of their prosperity and treat them so differently because they are prosperous when in fact they are just rank sinners with money. And that we become rank sinners with money because they have money and we put, listen to this, we put this prestige power on them like they're some kind of elite because they have money. And they become people who influence our feelings, influence our relationship with the living God, touch us deeply on the inside because we see them prosper. And oftentimes we are moved by the prosperity of others who don't even know God. When in fact, oftentimes the prosperity of those that do not know God is a trap to those who do know God. And you have to watch yourself that you are not influenced by the wicked. Because if you are, what it does is it takes you away from the things of God. 
And all of a sudden, you start following that lifestyle. You start acting like them. You start evaluating things like they do. And it won't be long before you start doing what they do because they were economically in a position that impressed you. Do not ever let people with money impress you. Let me tell you something. When you have met God, no one ought to impress you. I don't care who they are. I don't care how many degrees they have. I don't care if they're the president of the United States 18 times over. No one impresses you but God. Because you met God. Are you following me? And sometimes we let little things like money impress us and stop us. And we wonder how in the world they got there. And we'll even go to the place where we do what they do to get there like they did. And all of a sudden, we're in trouble, like it said in those last verses. We pierce ourselves through and wonder what happened. Hmm, interesting. The psalmist, if you will, his name is Asaph. He's actually the psalmist with David in the book of Psalms. He's a music leader of David, worship leader. And Psalm 73 makes a couple of statements that all of us probably can relate with. Listen to these verses. There's probably not one person in here that doesn't relate with this guy. His name is Asaph. In verse number one, it says these words. The Psalm of Asaph, truly God is good to Israel. <laughs> and then he goes on and says, to, do, to such as are pure in heart. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I, I, I could preach two weeks on just what he just said. See, you don't read a verse and just skip over it. You've got to read a verse for what the verse say. Truly God is good to Israel. Then he clarifies what part of Israel he's good to. To those, to such as ones that have a pure heart. A pure heart for what? For the things of this world? No, a pure heart for God. That's what he's talking about. So if you want the God of Israel to be good to you, you're going to have to have a pure heart for the things of God. That's what he just said. I haven't even gotten into the verse yet. I don't know where that came from. It just kind of like popped out of me right there. So anyway, here's what it says. As for me, my feet had almost stumbled. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Listen to what he just said. Have you ever been in a place in your walk with God where you can't figure something out and it's like... Oh, this doesn't make sense at all, and it almost hurt your walk with God. And you almost had to go past what doesn't make sense and get in to start walking in faith. And he makes this statement. He says, but as for me, they're talking about Asaph now. He says, my feet almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. What's he talking about? I almost fell away from the things of God. Oh, wow, what a statement. And then verse number three comes along and describes what it is. For I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. In other words, he saw the wicked, those that did not, wicked or somebody who doesn't serve God, doesn't give a flip about God, denies God, cusses God out, says there is no God, a fool serve God, do everything contrary. Have you ever noticed oftentimes people that are the most contrary to God are the richest? And they are traps. Christians to your walk. Because if you don't understand what the process is, because you see, the devil has no problem in making them rich as long as he can get his soul, which he will have, and your soul, because you can't figure it out. And you almost slip from where you're at because it doesn't make sense why, you, my goodness, you serve God. You, you oh my goodness, you went to church three times last month. My goodness, you even threw in a $5 bill. Didn't want to, but you threw it in. 
and you, and you even read your Bible a little bit, and you didn't fall asleep during the preaching, and you started to give yourself, and all of a sudden, those that do nothing start to flourish economically in front of you. Anybody been there besides me? And you say to yourself, ah, what the heck, God, is this all about? I serve you, I go to church, I sing to you, I raise my heart, my hands to you, I've given everything up to follow you, and they don't do nothing, and they prosper in me. What? I have nothing. What's going on, God? And that's what exactly where the devil wants you to do, is start questioning your relationship with God. That'll slip you away from the things of God. Does anybody listen? Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, I'm not finished. Don't clap yet, I haven't finished. Why don't you clap when I'm finished? Verse, in a minute, verse number 11. Let's jump to verse number 11. And they say, how does God know? In other words, what they're really saying, God doesn't know nothing. I know everything, I got money. That's what the translation is. And there is... And, 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 and there is knowledge in the most high. you got to be kidding me. That's what they, the rich people that are wicked say. Verse number 12, watch this, verse 12. Behold, those who are ungodly, who are always at ease, they increase in riches right before your very eyes. It look like they're doing just so good all the time. They increase in riches. Go to verse 16 with me. In verse 16, it says this. Then I thought, I thought how to understand this. It was too painful to me. Have you ever seen this when you're serving God and somebody around you doesn't serving God and they prosper and you're not prospering, you're struggling and it becomes a very painful thing because you're saying, maybe God hates me. Maybe God doesn't love me. Maybe God is not there with me. Maybe there isn't even a real God. Isn't that guy prospering? Doesn't that prove that? No, not at all. Verse number 17 comes along and says this, until... I went in to the sanctuary of God. In other words, I was falling apart. I almost slipped. There was failure that looked like they were going to, they always seemed to prosper at everything. I was really frustrated with them. They question God. They don't serve God. I, I don't question. I serve God. I do what I'm supposed to do. I'm not prospering at all. And he says, I don't understand. It was so painful. I couldn't figure it out until I walked into church. And then I realized there's a bigger picture than that guy's wallet. <laughs> there's a bigger picture than that guy's wallet. Verse 18. Surely you set them on a slippery place. Oh, my, my, my. They're going to fail. You cast them down into destruction. Verse 19. Oh, and how they are brought to desolation. In a moment, they are utterly consumed with terror. That's their future when your future is eternal life with God. And when you get into the house of God, you start to realize how important you are to God and how important God is to you. And you may be the brokest person in the world, but you're the richest to God. Come on, somebody. So here's the point. Real quick. Number one point. Avoid the influences of the wicked. Number two. Watch the motive of the heart. It's very easy to have our hearts swayed by finances and becomes the motive of what we do becomes foolish. This is really all about your heart with God. It's not about what you do, what you don't do, what you accomplish, don't accomplish. That's all important. It's all wonderful. But it's really all about this product that beats inside your chest that governs your direction and your heart. And if you and I don't watch our hearts and the motives of our hearts, sometimes our motives become tainted by life 
and wealth and finances. And if you're going to be wealthy and God's going to prosper you, you're going to have to watch yourself in the midst of prosperity that the motive of what you do is not about money, it's about one person got it, make him an elder. It's not, let me try it again. It's not about money, it's about God. God. And that's what this is all about, is the heart. And the motive of the heart can so easily change when the finances come in. And that's where we make massive decisions and massive mistakes. And it's hard because all of a sudden lifestyles change. All of a sudden your, your, you know, your living conditions change. All of a sudden your appearances change. All of a sudden you're doing, going, saying, being, uh, uh, speaking things you never spoke, done, did before. All because of the finances. But the motive of the heart is what cannot ever change. And that's the very key to this success. Is what the heart does. I can't tell you how many people in my life I have known over the years that start to come to church, start to tithe, start to get somewhat successful, start to pay their bills, start, you know, they got this great job or even two great jobs, and all of a sudden they have more money than they know what to do with. They buy a house, they buy a second house, can't come to church. You know why they can't come to church? Because it's got two houses. Now, you know, they pay on both of them. They feel funny on weekend coming to church. After all, they're making payment on it. So they take their weekend, go to the second house, and all of a sudden, the motive of their life becomes the economics that condition, the economics that keeps them going instead of the God they met. And when the motive of your life changes, may I say this to you? You're going to bring destruction on yourself. Proverbs, the 20th chapter, verse 20. And then verse 22. We'll skip 21. A faithful man will abound with blessing. Notice the word faithful. You ought to circle it. If there's anything God's looking for, you've got to hear this from me. You're listening? God's not looking for qualified. God's looking for faithful. I'm teaching that to young pastors even as I speak. God's not looking for qualified God's looking for faithful. The world looks for qualified and doesn't give a flip about faithful. But God is looking for that which is faithful, not just qualified. And many people come through the church and they'll have all the gifts and talents, they'll have all the intelligence and smarts, they'll have all the degrees, all the abilities, they'll have all the skills to be qualified, but they find themselves in a place where they're not faithful. And God writes through Paul to Timothy and he says, Timothy, the things that I shared with you, I want you to share it with those who are faithful and are apt to teach. Two things, faithful and who are apt to teach, not people who can teach. They haven't even learned how to be qualified teachers yet. Just apt to, maybe someday they will. What was the first thing God was looking for? Share with what I have with those who are what? Faithful. God's looking for faithful. Man, you're not getting me away from God. You're not getting me out of my spot. I'm going to keep on going no matter what comes and there will come. I'm staying in there with God. I'm going to remain faithful. And then you, from the faithfulness, develops the quality to do what? Teach. And to be qualified. God's always looking for the faithful. So he comes along and he says, a faithful man will abound in blessings. But he who hastens to be rich, in other words, I'm chasing after money, not God, will not be unpunished. Jump down to verse 22. It says, a man with an evil eye hastens, chases after riches. Evil means an eye contrary to the ways of God. Now, riches aren't contrary to the ways of God. How you handle riches are, if the heart isn't right. He says, and does not consider Poverty will come upon him. Oh, my goodness sakes. You find so many people that had things going so well. 
And all of a sudden, in the midst of going well, they start messing up. And they start messing up because they're not just stupid. They start messing up because they misunderstood that what happened and what took place is their motives of their heart had changed from the time that they began being faithful. How to get out of that? Get back to being faithful. And everything will be restored. And that's what God's talking about. We're talking about things to do. Avoid the influence of the wicked. Watch for the motive of the heart. Number three, maintain wisdom. What do I mean by maintaining wisdom? You can, you can, you can have wisdom but not maintain it. What good is wisdom if you have it today, but you give up on it tomorrow? What, what, is, what good is wisdom if you have a heart for something today, but you stop after a short period of time? You have got to have not only wisdom today, you've got to maintain that wisdom all through the rest of your life. And wisdom, without wisdom, you do stupid things. So all of a sudden, wisdom becomes so important for you in the dealing with riches. Because if you don't maintain the wisdom, then what happens, all the influence of the wicked come in, all the uh, compromise on the heart comes in, and you find yourself in a place of doing something you don't want to do. You have to maintain, if, I, if you hear me, the wisdom of God. I'm going to take you to Jeremiah, the 17th chapter, verse number 11. Let's just pop it up on the overhead. It's kind of a weird little verse, but I think you'll find it fascinating as I explain it to you. The 17th chapter, verse number 11 says this, as a partridge that broods but does not hatch, so is the, he who gets riches but not by right. In other words, not God's way. You can get riches. Everybody get riches. You know people that are ungodly that get riches their way. Riches isn't the issue. The issue is whether or not you get it right. God's way. It will leave him in the midst of days. In other words, have you ever known anybody that's made a whole lot done the wrong way and all of a sudden they find themselves broke down the road? Pfft. Some of you have been that way. Down the road, it'll leave him in the midst of days and at the end, he will be a fool. Now here's so that you can understand why wisdom must be maintained. Let me show you this verse. As a partridge, we don't have partridges. We don't understand partridges. But a partridge is a bird type that lays its eggs in a nest. And what it will do, it will build this nest, put its eggs in the nest, and then, like anything, will brood over them, sit on that nest, hang on them until the eggs hatch. But here it says these words that does not hatch. The ones that don't hatch is because the partridge built the nest in the middle of a road. And people, dogs, animals, sheep, goats in those days came by and trampled the nest. Not very wise. And you and I can be just doing everything the right way and not apply wisdom in your finances and you find yours and maintaining that wisdom and finding yourself building a nest in the middle of the road where everybody tramples on it and your eggs never hatch. You got to build the nest, you got to lay the eggs, you got to brood over them, but you also have to have wisdom about what you do and where you do it. Are you following me? So to anybody that doesn't do it the right way, God's way, then it's subject to leaving him right in the middle of life. All of a sudden you think you got it made and all of a sudden you find yourself down the road broke, wondering what the heck went on. And then at the end, you're nothing but a fool because you built your nest with your eggs in it in the middle of the road and got squished. And that stupidity, no wisdom. Isn't that an interesting verse? Which brings us to number four, things to do. Number one, remember, was avoid the influence of the wicked. Number two is watch the motives of the heart. Isn't that important? Number three, maintain wisdom. I like number four. Maintain a realistic value system. A realistic value system means you place value on areas of life that you can understand and see. There is no value to life 
without God. Now listen to what I'm going to say to you. You could have the greatest cars. You could have a garage full of Bentleys. You could have trucks that are hiked to the roof up here. You've got to have two ladders to get up to them. You could have second homes, third homes, fourth homes. You can have all of that. And then you place a value on that instead of the value on what you had in the beginning, which has to be simply your heart totally and completely fixed on him. Can I just say this to you? you gotta get, if you don't get anything, get this. This has never been a compromised relationship with God. And I've said it every service for 26 years. It's an all are nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. You cannot have a little Jesus, a little of the job, a little of the wife, little of the kids, little of the sports, little of the vacation, a little of the money, bring it all together and have one big family life that works. The value system is not there. It's God and there is, he's so out in front, there isn't even a second place. That's the kind of relationship. You know, let me, can I just say this? In American churches, that is not preached. And you know why it's not preached? Because you, they think, can't handle the truth. And they much rather tickle your ears so you come back to church and give your money than someone tell you the truth. In other words, if you have the wrong value system, you will mess up everything. There's only one value in your life. That's God, and everything else follows when you put him first. The Bible says in 1 Timothy, I'll just put it up on the overhead for you, the sixth chapter, this time verse number seven. It says, and we brought nothing into this world. And it's for certain you're going to take everything you've ever got with you. Does your Bible say that? I mean, some people act that way because they have a wrong value system. Like, it's mine. I got to have it. It's all I have. Can I tell you something? If that's all you have, you need to slap yourself. You got God, and he's all you have, and he's all you ever need. And he, when you get that part down, he'll give you the rest. So he says, you're not going to take anything with you. I mean, you ever seen dead men? They don't take nothing. You know? Their kids are coming in and say, oh, dad doesn't need that gold ring. Let me have that. Uh, you know, oh, mom doesn't need that. Uh, but she got gold in her teeth. Let me, let me shut her mouth. Take the gold out of her teeth. Uh, but put that in my pocket, too. That's worth some money right there. I'll wash it off. It's okay. Can I tell you something? I know it's gross. Happens all the time. Here's my point. You can't take anything with you. You came into this world naked. And what a sight you were. You had a pot belly, and when you leave, you'll have another pot belly. <laughs> you ever seen old people like me? It's like, what the heck happened? I look like my grandchildren. They're only a year old. You're not taking one thing with you. Place the value where it needs to be while you're here with God. I'll close with these verses. Just pop up First Timothy, the last verse. Verse 17 says, Commend those who are rich in present age not to be haunting, nor to trust in, un I love this word, uncertain riches. Don't you know they're uncertain? But in a living God who gives us all richly, all things, to enjoy. Verse 18. Let them do good that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willingly to share. Do I have 19? Storing up for themselves a good foundation. This is a value system. 
for the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. Listen, listen, listen. You may not have the Bentley, but you will have the gold of heaven for eternity. And I don't know about you, I'd much rather have that than anything. And that's the value we're talking about. If God spoke to you tonight, come on, give the Lord a great big praise. Let me make sure everybody's all right with God before you go. Now wait, listen. Why leave this place? Die and go to hell. Why not change? Allow God to have you. Once and for all. Every bit of you. That's what the words born again mean. When Jesus said you must be born again, it means giving God all of your heart. Giving God all of your life. Someone said to me one time, well, Pastor, if God wants all of me, he'll just take it. He's not a thief. He's not a robber. He's not a conniver. He doesn't make you do anything. It's just time for some of you to give God all of your heart and give God all of your life. What an abundant life waiting for you who will be faithful and serve God. How good are you to Israel? and to those who are faithful. And it starts by giving God all of your heart, and it starts by giving God all of your life. Now, let me just make this comment. It's not about what you have in your head. We all know who Jesus is. We celebrate Christmas. We celebrate Easter. Nowhere in the Bible does it say because you know who Jesus is, and you celebrate Christmas and Easter, it makes you a Christian. The devil knows who Jesus is, and he's not a Christian, right? So therefore, it's not about you having head knowledge or mental acceptance of him, mental uh, acknowledgement of him. It's about you in your heart relationship with him. Have you done something with your heart? Have you given God all of your heart, given God all of your life? You see, it's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Always has been, always will be, all or nothing. All or nothing. I'll prove it to you, last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation. You've heard of the book of Revelation. Jesus says in the book of Revelation, I'm coming again. And you know he is. And he says, when I come, listen to this, I better find you hot. Watch this, watch this, watch this. Or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Wow, what a rude, crude statement from Jesus. What did he just really say? He said, people who call themselves Christians that are lukewarm are not real Christians at all. What's lukewarm? A little in, a little out, a little up, a little down. Lukewarm, a token prayer, occasional church attendance. Here's lukewarm. You're not against God. Oh, no, you're not against God, but you're not wholehearted for God. God is just something in your life. He's not everything in your life. And until you make him everything, he will never be something. And so here we are in this safe, friendly place. We've laughed, we've clapped, we've sung songs. You were great listening to the word of God t t tonight. Why leave this place without giving God? In this safe, friendly place, you can give God all of your heart. You can give God all of your life. Tonight, it's your night of salvation. Tonight is your night of salvation. God brought you here for a divine appointment. Now, wait a minute. You've had a lot of appointments, plumbers and attorneys and doctors and school teachers, and most of us had a lot of appointments with the principal. You know what I'm talking about? You've had a lot of appointments, but tonight you have an appointment with God. God brought you here not just to hear a message, not just to sing a song. He brought you here to give all of 
your heart and all of your life to him. You say, well, pastor, how do I do that? How do I give him all of my heart? How do I give him all my life? Let's don't do it your way or my way. Let's do it God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. In a moment, we'll count to three. We'll go like this. One, two, three, and I'll pop my hands together. I go, bang, when you hear that sound, bang, your hands go up. I'll see your hand go up. What you're saying by the raising of your hand in the family rooms, I'm talking to you all across this auditorium, what you're saying by the raising of your hand is I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. I want to give God tonight all of my heart and all of my life. I want to be born again. Listen, I didn't make this up. God's what he said. I'm just telling you what he said. And tonight is your night of salvation. I already know you know who Jesus is. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about giving God all of your heart, giving God all of your life, being born again, headed for heaven, and denying your presence in hell. Somebody needs to love you enough, respect you enough, honor you enough to tell you the truth. And I love, respect, and honor you enough to tell you the truth. I'm not playing games with you, but I'm telling you exactly the way it is. And you're going to have to respond because it's your call and your choice. God could have made a billion robots look just like you to worship and sing songs to him, to follow him. But he didn't want a robot. He made you just the way you are so that you can make the free will choice to give him all of your heart and all of your life because that's what he's looking for is a heart that wants him. Is that you? Tonight is your night. I'm going to count to three. Who should raise your hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? You know who you are. If you've never given him all of your heart, you know who you are. I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your life, you know who you are. If you're one of those people that are in here and you're just not sure, make sure. Tonight is your night. You say, Pastor, wait a minute, wait a minute, Pastor. You want me to raise my hand? I'll be embarrassed. People will see me. People I came with will see me. People behind me will see me. I'll feel funny. Yep, you might feel funny. But it's better to feel funny for a moment than to be in hell forever and ever because you care more about what people think instead of what God sees. Come on, no one's that dumb. But the devil's trying to talk you out of putting your hand up right now. And tonight is your night of salvation. Are you ready? I'm going to count to three, pop my hands together. You get your hand up all over this place. Are you ready? I'm speaking to you. Get ready. Here it is. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one, two, three, four, five. Thank you. Six. Thank you. Seven. Thank you. Back over here. Anybody else? There's seven wise people on this side. Where are you? All the way to the back here. Seven, eight. Thank you. Back there. God bless you. Where are you? There's nine. Thank you. God bless you. There's 10. There's 11. Thank you. Anybody else? Real quick. Anybody else? Go ahead. Put your hand out. I see it. I see it. Anybody else? There's 11 wise people. Anybody else? Anybody else? There's 12. God bless you, sir. There's 12. Good to see you. Anybody else? Come on. It takes guts to do this, but it took guts for God to walk on Jerusalem's road, beaten bloody mess to hang on a cross for you. The Son of God, creator of the heavens and earth, put it all on the line for you. And if he put it all on the line for us, we ought to all put it on the line for him. Anybody else? There's a dozen of you. There's another one. Thirteen. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Let's give the Lord a great big praise for 13 white people. All 13 of you, I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend. Get a hold of your stuff, if you will. I want you to get out of your seat, get in the aisle. All 30 of you, raise your hand, you're serious about God. <clears throat> get your stuff. Bring a friend if you need to bring a friend. Everybody else, check with your neighbor and say, come on, I'll go with you. You can come too. Even though you didn't raise your hand, you can still come. But all 13 of you, I want you to get out of your seat, get in the aisle, meet me right here in front. Let's stand and welcome them. No one leaves here in this period of time. You just come. You come right now. Come on, come on. Just as you are. Come and give them a hand as they come. Come on, you come too. Come on. Come on, home. 
Come on home. Come on home. Come on, you come to. Come on home. You come to. Hurry. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Thank God you guys have come. I want you to take a moment and look over here at Dr. B. We call his name is Becker, but we call him Dr. B because B is shorter than Becker. And it's right next to A, so you'll never forget it. Dr. B wants to do three things. He's going to pray with you, give you some free stuff now that you're a Christian in a moment after you pray, and then give you an idea about a program we have that will help you get strong in Jesus. Let us help you. We're putting our application in. You need a church that's a great church. You need a church that's healthy in the Word of God. You need pastors that'll love you and care for you. Application, here it is. Forget Amazon, I'm here for you. And uh, we're, we're, we just love you a whole lot. And we're putting in our application for you to help you get strong and to have a blessed future because God wants to prosper you in every area. So only take a moment, make a left turn, follow Pastor Becker right over there. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.